Welcome everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about inflation, mortgage rates, pending home sales, and the jobs report. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. It is wonderful to be here on, you know, it's Friday morning and it's inflation day, but inflation day doesn't really have the same kind of value because I just want to say, <laughs> oh, thank that's you. So good. Thank you, Michelle. Gracias and love it. And the okay, wait, for shirt. those who are just listening, uh, you know, on, just on audio, he just held up a cup that says labor over inflation. So he got some merch from one of our listeners. Um, tell us about that, Logan. Yes. Yeah, so um, the cup says labor over inflation. I have a lovely shirt that says chart daddy on it. So, and some other goodies as well. So we, we welcome all merch ideas from anybody that listens. And, and thank you all. We're still a top 10 business podcast in America for a niche podcast to compete with the big boys. We are, we're very excited. But fitting that I got this cup now because here we are today. The PC inflation report came out. Pretty tame. I could make a case it was maybe slightly lower than anticipated. Uh, Ten-year yield went up one or two basis points, now is down, not much of a reaction. If this report had come in you know, a few months ago when the 10-year yield is at 4.60%, it would be a big deal. And so the reason I wanna talk about this is that where are we now with the mortgage rate story with inflation, jobs, and the Fed? Because we made a really big move already. I mean, I can make a case that we almost have made a 2% move lower in mortgage rates from the very, very peak in 20, uh, to, uh, 2023 to the very low point uh, of this year. So the 10-year yield has not broken 380 yet, right? So uh, it, it's pretty, it was pretty intense there for a while, that big day where, you know, where market stress, the 10-year yield got as low as 3.66%. But we didn't close below 380. And uh, uh, even with the negative revisions of jobs, even with the baby pivot, uh, even with the softer, that softer inflation data, we're still not there. So I think for, for going out in the future, number one, unless we break below this level, we're not going lower in mortgage rates uh, uh, right. unless the spreads make it happen on there. Then spreads actually were really good this week on some of the pricing. So uh, in, in this context, uh, we have to think about it that the Fed Fed policy is still restrictive in their own mind. They haven't cut rates any. Um, if they continue the way they're going, really, you, you really need labor data weakness to, to, to take you lower because we've already had such a big move. Remember, the bond market always goes ahead of the Fed and they've done it again. And the Fed hasn't cut rates any um, the bond market has now done this three times. The previous two times, it just reversed right back up because the labor market wasn't breaking or getting softer. But now the labor market is getting softer. So now we are in this situation where uh, there is some confusion this week. You know, people are saying, oh "My God, why aren't rates lower? The job revisions are okay. the The economy is not breaking, right? right. GDP was revised higher, three percent." Um, consumption was up, jobless claims are still low. If jobless claims were spiking higher, all of us are having a different conversation, but it hasn't yet. So for those that are asking, why, why are mortgage rates lower after everything that's happened, it's already made a big move lower, right? So where Fed policy is right now, it is still very restrictive, right? And you know we haven't even started a rate cut process uh, uh, and we have to just take the labor data, the economic data going ahead. The inflation data isn't as valuable anymore uh, uh, in that context. So uh, even if you had a few upticks in some of the inflation reports going out of the future, if the labor data gets weaker, the labor data will kind of run the show. So crazy. I mean, I feel like it's just a hurry up and wait, right? Because we're our, we're all in this anticipation of like lower rates and what that means. And I think consumers are in anticipation of lower rates. Some of them are like, let me just wait a little bit because everybody knows the Fed's going to cut. So it, it feels like forever and we're still not there. 
it's interesting because the, again, there's this, there's this, okay, there's this conversation that lower mortgage rates have not helped housing. Okay. I totally disagree. And Sarah, you know, this is my thing. I do not think people are versed in reading purchase application data correctly. <laughs> I just don't, I just, I'm 14 years I've seen this. And what, what's happened is that first of all, the new home sales had a massive beat recently. I think those numbers will get revised lower, but their purchase application data actually started to grow. Number one, lower rates, purchase application data went up. Number two, the existing home sales market was primarily negative the entire year, up until the last 12 weeks. And then the last 12 weeks, it's for the first time it's been positive. It's a positive kind of trend for 12 weeks. Now, it isn't a big positive trend, but it actually is a material change. And then the pending home sales report came out. And I, and I, actually, I actually do feel bad for people because when somebody sees the pending home sales and they see it at all-time lows, they immediately think that, oh my God, home sales are going to all-time lows, which would actually like be under 2 million. And it's like, no, the pending home sales doesn't is not saying that. First of all, the pending home sales is not that old. Like in the early 1980s, we had under 2 million. So what's occurred is that two months ago, the pending home sales was at all-time lows. And existing home sales didn't drop to the um, the, the the low levels in the recent history. It's like 3.45 million. So I encourage everyone: if you go to our tracker data every single Saturday, we have a weekly pending contract data, and it's a little bit more stable than the pending home sales data. Right? Everything kind of trends the same, but it's very hard to do a one to one. Uh, uh, with some of these survey reports, because they could exaggerate to the upside and to the downside. So some seasonal adjustments can be haywire. So you just kind of want to take the pennies. Not much is going on, right? Not much has gone on for some time now. I, I could understand why people got confused with the pending home sales report. But in this case, there's actually a, a change in the housing data. Um, I think some people might have it. Well, why aren't we seeing a V-shaped recovery? Traditionally, these are very bearish people who are trying to make a claim about it. But if you actually read the tracker, you could actually see the counts. We do these counts on purpose. Uh, there is a change. It's just not in a very good seasonal time. So uh, the last two times rates fell, it came near the seasonal time where we see the growth. So that actually makes a difference. There's always a seasonal pickup and then there's a seasonal decline happens every year, right? So uh, be a little bit more mindful of the seasonality of housing because I could already see what's going on. People are saying there's no housing demand rebound, new home sales beat, purchase application is possible. So you, you have to take it in relationship to where we were before. Okay, let's talk a little bit about those mortgage spreads because that was good news this week and it was notable. So what did we yeah, see and yeah, why? Yeah, it, it, there was w one of the days where the 10-year yield had gone up a few basis points, but mortgage rates went down, right? And that's that's where the, Sarah, that's where the love dance, right? The it's slow dance slow between dance. the 10 years. Sometimes, sometimes we get closer in that slow dance. And this is the spreads. It's not back to normal, but there are times where the 10-year yield can go up and mortgage rates do fall because the spreads are getting better. And remember, when you're working from a very elevated level in spreads, uh, uh, you're, you once the rate cut cycle starts to get, you start to move down lower. You have to adjust kind of your takes on mortgage rates uh, uh, to that. This is why we kind of said, well, 2024, the spreads can get better. The closer we get to the first Fed rate cut, the spread should get better. It got better a little bit earlier than I than I thought it would, but we can noticeably see this now on even some of the daily data. So uh, the spreads might be some of the best things that could happen for rates at this stage, but as long as the economy is intact. And here's a good example of how I explain this. In the previous decade, I do these yearly forecasts. I go, the 10-year yield is going to be a range between 1.6 and 3% until the next recession hits. That kind of was the case for for majority of the time. And then when the recession came, you know, 10-year yield went lower. Think about it in that light. We're trying to find a range with the 10-year yield, you know, during this uh, uh, economic expansion. And, you know, sometimes we break over four and a quarter. Sometimes we uh, uh, try to get below 380. And we, we did that in 2023. But then, you know, the Gandalf line was created. Labor market was a breaking 10-year yield went up. The growth rate of inflation had been falling right when the 10 year yield went up this is where everyone gets confused right we had like we had lower mortgage rates with 
and nine percent CPI inflation or you know inflation being higher. So it's 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 a little bit different uh, uh, now. The labor data is going to have to be our guide on this, and then the spreads getting better is beneficial. Once you start to head toward a normal level of spreads, you could kind of X out that conversation, but we still have a, a lot of leeway for that to be beneficial for housing. And, and, and in this case, we saw it this week with one of the days where the 10-year yield was up, but mortgage rates actually pricing was lower. It, it does happen from time to time, but uh, that's because the spreads are getting better. Again, last year, bad story. After the Silicon Valley banking crisis, it was it, it never got enough love, but the spreads actually got to pre-cycle highs. That was not a, a, a good situation. So far, not the case this year, uh, and that makes that makes a material difference this year versus last year. I think that's why you know we see the potential. I see the potential for two or three of these factors to happen that would really lower rates. So you know, spreads get better, or they are better better already. You know, there's a rate cut from the Fed. Um, you know, the market sees that things are happening. Um, all these things happen, and we could it could be a material difference in in mortgage rates. It, it is, and again, I, I I overweight the labor data over Fed rate cuts at, at this stage too. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, after the pending home sales report came out, people said, "Well, the Fed's going to have to be more dovish." The Fed does not care about the existing <laughs> home sales market. I, I hate to break this to everyone. Think about this: we got to two thousand eight levels in demand. Back then, we were doing zero interest rate policies, mortgage-backed securities, tax. Everybody threw everything they can to revive the housing market. Here, nothing. You do not hear anything from the Fed. And it's not like the growth rate of inflation is at 9% anymore or 7%, CPI 9% uh, PC. Um, where they can be concerned is the new home sales market because that revolves around construction workers, remodeling jobs. Those things actually would you know, hurt the labor market. Unemployment rates could go up. Jobs could be lost. So in that context, that's why I say that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Fed was happy to see that new home sales bounced uh, uh, because, you know, permits fall. I mean, they can't be that blind, okay, that, you know, we, we have historical data lines that show us when permits fall and starts fall and remodeling companies like Home Depot and Low Warren, that's not a good thing for the labor market. but. Thing. Uh, uh, they're hopefully they're 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 a little bit more mindful of how the construction cycle works. That's how economic cycles have worked. So we we just need to keep an eye on the labor data. And I know we're we're going to talk a lot about rate cuts, but the market kind of already priced in a lot of the kind of uh, uh, early rate cut action. And there's a little bit more validity in it in terms of uh, uh, yield staying lower now than it has in the past. Okay, so let's get into if, you know, if the jobs numbers are all important, next week is jobs week, right? Yes, and the chart daddy loves jobs week more than anything <laughs> because uh, we got, we got of course, chart uh, jobs week is, so th think about it in this light, there's four reports, job openings data, job openings, the Fed loves jobs openings. Some people hate job openings, but they love it, so we have to love it. Right. And, and job openings go lower, quits go lower, hires go lower. Right now, there's one aspect of the job openings data we haven't talked about much. It's the layoff portion of the job openings data. So all the other data lines are softening. The layoffs, the layoff aspect has not deteriorated. That's a, that's something you were going to have to keep an eye on going out in the next uh, 15 to 60 months. That how does the job openings layoff data, because that would be noticeable to them. Um, the ADP report comes out on Wednesday. Out of all the four jobs report, that's the least valuable. Uh, the market kind of looks at it this way. It's kind of like, you know, an annoying brother that has to come to the party that, you know, you don't really care about. <laughs> um, then, of course, as always, jobless claims data. Jobless claims data was a smidge lower this week. And we highlight this because finally the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, came on TV and said, we follow jobless claims and jobless claims have been falling for months. Well, it's not falling for months anymore, but it's not breaking out. I think jobless claims to them is the key. If they will get so nervous that that data line starts to break on them, because once it breaks, it's kind of over. It doesn't have these, you know, 
uh, uh, while it goes up to a certain amount and just falls right back down. You could do it on a shorter end, but once the breaks, traditionally it's it's recessionary, especially with all the other Labor Day nines. But when Jobs Friday comes, again, uh, wage growth is key. Uh, the run rate, meaning that we, we do have to create a lot more jobs to keep the unemployment rate uh, uh, from going up higher. So it, it becomes more interesting going out. I know one of the Fed presidents said, well, we think unemployment rates going to 4.6 to 4.9% like we talked about. And I was like, <laughs> did you, you guys, you guys really said that, you know? So um, it does get confusing because there's all these Fed presidents and they all like Bostic yesterday said, oh, GDP is at 3%. I need more. I need Sarah. He said, "I need more data." <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I, I I know that I know they get in a team huddle and they say everybody kind of say their own things, but like five days ago, you're like, "We may need a fifty basis cut." It's like you you have to like you have to stay stable and yeah. not be so. Uh, if you, if you really want to believe that, then you don't say, "Well, a fifty basis cut might be warranted." So. Again, labor data over everything. Jobs week is big. Uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, when the next jobs report comes out, the job article we're going to write is going to be very detailed now with all the revisions and everything. Because with the revisions now, I, the, the, the labor data is more in line to what I was looking for. So I, to me, it looks normal. Uh, it's a slightly higher above my estimates, but it actually looks normal to me. So uh, uh, when people think, oh, it's deteriorating, for me, it looks normal. I w deterioration to me means jobless claims. So, but, but that's huge now because guess what? This is the report before the Fed September. So a lot of people are discussing: Do they go fifty? Well, let's just say the jobs report is bad, but jobless claims don't break up higher. I actually think because this Fed has been very conservative on that, they still do a twenty-five basis point cut. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a this is a Fed that after the Silicon Valley banking crisis said, well, this might tight lending standards for uh, small business lending, but we're still going to hike anyway. They finally got the labor deterioration they wanted, but they've got to make sure it doesn't break on them. Because when it breaks on them, then everybody goes, oh, well, everyone told you so. Why were you so late and everything? So uh, uh, they're trying to thread a needle in this uh, context. And this is why Jobs Week is very critical. They're trying to thread a needle, but to your point, it feels like every other day there's a different message coming out. I mean, after Powell's talk at Jackson Hole last week, we thought for sure we knew what was happening. Everybody was on the same page. And this week we've seen, like you said, Bostic said that, other people are saying, and it's like, how can things change that much in a day? Finish, Sarah. <laughs> They are still very, for, for those for those that remember the yeah. Riddick movie, skittish tombs. That's kind of what I say. Um, remember, there are Fed presidents that play bad cop, and then there's Fed presidents that play good cop. Bowman, she's like, I I don't know about rate cuts. Inflation could reaccelerate higher. She's not even in the rate cut <laughs> camp. But so just remember, there's good good Fed cop. There's bad Fed cop. They kind of work this game out to the marketplace. They kind of want they. It also, you have to remember, they are talking to the markets. They're really yeah. not talking to you and me. Uh, they kind of want bond traders and everybody to kind of have someone in line. Um, you remember the whole Gandalf line we created oh, yes. in 2023? Yes. So in 2023, the 10-year yield got to a point. It's like, oh my God, if this breaks, we're in a recession. I don't see the recessionary data lines here. Like the labor market isn't breaking. So we're going to bring Gandalf the gray and we're not breaking underneath here. They kind of were like, saying in their own ways, hey, the labor market isn't deteriorating. We think the market is pricing in way too many uh, 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 break cuts or weakness in, in demand. That's why that two-year yield is important. Here, we're, we're in a different spot now. It was like, we see the labor market softening. So it gets more interesting on who plays good cop and bad cop. But I guarantee you, once jobless claims break, they yeah. all, they Wrong, all get in line. Because okay. then, then they have to say that okay, my my I I don't agree with my mandate on the labor market, and I don't think publicly they can say that anymore if that's the case. Okay, so uh, Gandalf was very uh, popular; people understood that. You broke out a a new pop culture reference this week on social. Um, I don't watch Game of Thrones, so you had to explain it to me. But tell oh, us, tell us what your new one is. The Hordor. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I had to explain to Sarah what. 
you know, Hordor or who Hordor was and what it was about. Uh, the 380 line. Okay, so I, I'm not trying to be annoying people. Trust me, uh, I would li- I'd, I'd be completely happy if the 10 year yield would have broken under 380. But I didn't think it was going to be the case early in the year. And here with all this drama, I get it. People are uh, all these messages. It's going to break. It's going to break. And I'm like, Hordor, hold the line, you know. So I had to explain to Sarah who Hordor was, what was that whole thing, and holding the you know holding the cave door for. The, the creatures not to come out. So uh, the bond market is holding that line. This is not the Gandalf line, I, I would say, but yeah, that 380 level, pesky. I get it. They were like, I trust me. You, I remember all these messages. It's going to break, job revisions, Fed, baby pivot, everything, whatever. It's still here. So the labor data getting weaker can get us there, can get us there. But it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hold the door as long as they can. But eventually... Hordor couldn't hold it off and he became a <laughs> white walker, you know? So, yeah, I try to get cu- culture references because I think if someone could visually think of something in their mind, you oh, know, yeah. you know, Gandalf, you're not going to pass. We're not going to break this 337 really, or, you know, that 380 is going to hold the line until eventually it breaks, but not just yet. So uh, uh, it's, we're trying to make economics fun. You're trying and to make it. And you're I'm trying to make it it's fun. Good. I am the chart chart daddy, right? You know, <laughs> labor of labor. We're trying to make it as fun as possible. Um, Our listeners I, I, are again, only for some, encouraging for, you. For some of those that actually see me on Twitter and how I handle the doomers, you know, I try. I do that for entertainment purposes, right? So, um, again, it's it's uh, still the key is that this is jobs week. This is a key jobs week because the Fed meeting going out. So if you're talking 25 and quarter, uh, 25 to 50 basis points, we get to test their resolve. Uh, if they do do a 50 basis points cut with a weaker labor data, then the jobless claims data becomes really important then because then they're like, oh, okay, okay. So they're trying to find where they think neutral policy is. This is the really nerdy part of this discussion. The Fed wants to get down to a level to where they're not too restrictive and they're not accommodative. Okay. So this is why I say it's a baby pivot. It's not a real pivot. A real pivot is like, okay, we're going to neutral and we're going to get there eventually, but uh, um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. They didn't do that. They basically just said we're cutting. So um, it's going to be a slow process, but Labor over inflation. And today, you know, it's what it's like today we saw the report and everyone's like, oh God, these these reports aren't gonna be that big anymore. So So good. Logan, thank you so much for being on. We will um I encourage people to look at the tracker, which will be out by the time this comes out, and uh, we'll talk again soon. We'll talk again soon. And for Denver, Chicago, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, Las Vegas. Uh, Arizona, we are coming on the newer tour and the newer tour is going to be even more exciting than the last uh, uh, two <laughs> years because we got more new charts to put in there. And I love it. Get more charts in there. And it's a much different part of the cycle. Now, I'm so glad that I don't have to say, I don't think rates are going to go now. It's like, okay, all right, we're finally getting there. We're finally getting it's to much a better, better. Can't wait. Can't wait for it. You guys join us if you can. Thank you so much, Logan. Pleasure.